Linda Smith invited me to speak to a group of ladies in Shediac on September the 20th. And that group of ladies is here this morning, so I would ask you to stand. Thank you for coming. I've spoken at various women's events, and so I was glad to take that opportunity to speak with them. So that morning, I was headed for Shediac, and um, halfway to Moncton, I realized I had forgotten my message at home. And that's a problem because I like to be there 30 minutes any time I speak. I want to be there ahead of time and get a sense of the place and to feel comfortable. Anyway, I turned around, went back, picked up my message, and headed out again. Linda had recommended a different exit to Shediac than the one I was familiar with. Um, so I was driving, and for some reason, I couldn't find that exit, even though she had given me clear directions in writing ahead of time. So out of fear of being late, for the speaking engagement, I took the first exit I came to. And as I proceeded onto that exit, I saw a tractor trailer coming towards me. And that was fine. I was going this way. The tractor trailer was coming this way. But then a second tractor trailer pulled out from behind the first tractor trailer to pass. And so now I had two tractor trailers coming directly towards me. And I realized in horror that I had taken the wrong exit. I took an off-ramp instead of an on-ramp. And so I realized I had nowhere to go, and all I could see was this massive grill of this truck heading towards me. And I thought, this is it. I'm going to die. And I wasn't afraid to die, but I was so sad that I was going to die over such a stupid mistake on my part. Anyway, the last thing I remember at that time, and you can bring the first slide up, please, Ron, was the sound of crunching and twisting metal coming towards me. And then I didn't remember anything for some time. And I've asked Hugh to speak to fill in the parts that I don't remember. And then I will speak again once I regained con to speak to once I regain consciousness. So, Hugh, if you could please speak. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm just going to fill in what she can't remember. She can't remember because she was in a coma for the first nine or ten days. And so, um, this accident happened at uh, 1047 in the morning on September the 20th, 2018. And it was at uh, 478 Calhoun, which is just out next to Memorial Cook. And um, I do just want to take a moment before I begin to thank everyone for coming this morning. Um, I've invited uh, several neighbors, and friends, and family, and uh, it was just a real joy to see you come in this morning. And I want you to feel really welcome. I want you to sit back as if you're in your own Chesterfield at home and just uh, in enjoy what God has done. Um, a special thanks goes out to Gordy Carter. Gordy's here this morning. Gordy and his wife, Charlene, and, and Gordy's parents. Gordy took over instantaneously at my auto body repair shop. I just walked out the door on uh, September the 20th, and uh, he took the reins, and he's never stopped. He's still there. So thank you to Gordy, wherever you are. Um, okay, so that morning, 1047, this accident took place completely unbeknownst to me. And at about quarter to 12, I got a call from Linda Smith just wanting to know if I knew how to get a hold of Barbara. And I said, well, she's supposed to be with you. And um, she said, well, I'll try her number. I can't make uh, any contact. I said, well, I'll try her number and I'll call you back. So I did no answer. So just finished with that, and I got a call from the hospital. And their question to me was, are you the next of kin of Barbara Morrissey? And this would be around, around 12, I would say, I got this call. And uh, of course, that's not exactly the question you want to hear when you pick up the phone. But uh, I said, yes, I am. Uh, what is the problem? And she said, well, they said, well, she's had a major motor vehicle accident. 
uh, multiple fractures, and we need you to come right away. So I told him, I said, I'm supposed to speak at a funeral in two hours' time. I will have to make a couple of calls. So they said, fine. I called Linda back and told her she's in a major accident. They need to pray. She said, we're doing that. So <clears throat> I then proceeded to call the church here and got a hold of Pastor Jeff at his home uh, the next call uh, just to let him know what had taken place. And um, so from there, uh, I got another call from the hospital. They said, you better come. Her blood pressure has dropped into her boots and you need to be here right away. Well, um, you know, it's, it's a short distance between Hughes Auto Body on the Pine Glen Road and Moncton City Hospital. It's a short distance, you just make one turn and go straight. But do you realize there are 11 sets of traffic lights between my shop and there? And it seemed like, it seemed like for a short distance it was an awfully long drive. And it also seemed like every light that could be red was red, and uh, traffic backed up at each one. And so that's where I sat. It was in traffic until I got there, got to the, uh, got to the emergency parking lot. It was full. Uh, I booted across the street to the other parking lot and uh, got a place and ran across the street. And my heart began to tell me, slow down. So I thought, well, yeah, we'll do that after a bit. So <laughs> arriving at the emergency, there was a nurse waiting as I came through the doors, asked me my name. She said, you need to come with me right away. And uh, so she took me into uh, this uh, prep room uh, where Barbara was on the table. And um, Barbara, by this time, uh, had uh, come back to consciousness um, she had been unconscious when she arrived because of bleeding out, and so they had put three units of blood in here, and by the time I got there, uh, from the second phone call till I got there, she had come back uh, to consciousness, so she looked up at me and smiled, almost an apologetic smile, as though I've really done it this time, <laughs> and, and she looked at me and said, I love you. And so I said, I love you, and I just made the sign that I'd be praying for her. And they said, we have to take her now. And the room was certainly a mess, and uh, multiple people all around the, the, uh, the table. And so uh, I understood and certainly did not delay them from, uh, from moving her off and, uh, <clears throat> and uh, getting her down to the OR room. Well, the nurse that had greeted me at the door said, do uh, you want to call a friend? And I said, no, no, I'm fine. And she said, really? Do you want to call a friend? And I said, no, I really don't need to. I'm, I'm fine. So she said, well, here's the cell phone. I said, well, I really don't know how to turn it on. And, and, I, and I didn't because I never carried a cell. And uh, so anyways, we figured that out. And uh, so anyways, um, uh, time went on. We already have the first photo up there, which is what I want to see. Um, that, what you see there, used to be a 2004 Lexus, and um, uh, it's unrecognizable at this point, but uh, that is what it was. Uh, let's go to the second photo. Second photo, as Barbara was describing the accident, she did hit uh, this tractor trailer, this red tractor trailer you see in the background. She hit that car, ab or that truck, absolutely dead center is what the truck driver told me, and which is apparent by the damage on the center part of the bumper. So um, it actually uh, wrote that tractor trailer off, uh, bent the frame. Uh, the tractor trailer driver told me, he said it snapped those frame bolts off like they were carrots and uh, drove the front wheels back into the fuel tanks. And... Um, and then came to a halt. Well, you'll see, just pop up the next, uh, you'll see here tire marks along the driver's side of the uh, Lexus. And what that is, is the second tractor trailer. Uh, the first one, she hit dead center. The second one, the guy he was passing, 
was so close to Barbara's vehicle that uh, you can see the tread marks on the front door. Actually, it's on the front fender, the front door, the rear door. And the next photo, just pop it up there, and you'll see where uh, that second tractor trailer exited from the, from the accident scene. Uh, on that second film, or second picture we seen, we noticed that the uh, driver's door was all caulked up. Uh, that was as a result of the impact, although that picture is taken in the salvage yard, the door was actually still closed and locked uh, on scene. Um, so um, I'll tell you the account that the tractor trailer driver uh, gave to uh, Barbara and I, uh, things that we did not know, and uh, Barbara uh, met with them on uh, the anniversary or shortly a few days after the anniversary. And uh, so this is his account. He said that um, when he pulled out to pass that truck, that all of a sudden he sees this car raked almost on him and the split second went through his mind. Am, am I on the wrong road? Of course that would happen to you. Uh, and, and so then he said, no, I'm on the right road. She's on the wrong road. And so he thought he might squeeze by on the shoulder. So he pulled to the shoulder. When he pulled to the shoulder, Barbara pulled to the shoulder. So to correct that, he pulls back to the center at the same time Barbara pulled back to the center. And it's just like meeting someone in an aisle. You step this way, then you step this way. All this is all happening within split seconds of, of, of time. So then, of course, it, the inevitable happened. The collision uh, took place that Barbara has lately described. And um, so he gets out of the truck, and he said, I did not want to go look in the car. He said, I was sure she was dead. And so he said, I just went over to the car, and he said the car was actually jammed underneath the truck. The impact had driven the front end of the, the car in underneath the front bumper of the truck. And so as he approached the vehicle, he could see her eyes were open. And then he said the strangest thing happened. He said her car just backed up. He said, I, I can't figure out how that happened, but it, her car just backed up, and, which was a good job that it had because um, the engine was on fire. And so um, we had not known that information. So uh, as you can see in the first photo, that the, the hood had already been shaved off the striker plate, and uh, so the hood was easily opened up and accessible. He goes to his truck, gets his fire extinguisher, and puts the fire out. And uh, in the process of time, the 911 was called, no doubt, by several people. There were people lining up behind the accident scene. And um, as God would have it, within this lineup of traffic were two off-duty first responders. They arrived almost immediately and uh, tried, to, um, tried to get into the vehicle. As I said, doors were all closed, doors were all locked. Then they tried to smash the glass out in the side windows, which is, of course, tempered glass does not smash easily, so they could not get in the doors. So eventually they got the rear window uh, broken, and that photo, there you go, thanks, Ron. So they broke the rear window out, and of these two responders, first responders, they, one was a lady, she climbed in through the back window, got up next to Barbara, uh, wrapped her in a blanket, and uh, comforted her until the, uh, the ambulance and the official on-duty first responders arrived. So um, uh, call that a coincidence? I think not. Um, I love what Midge Bennett said one time, she said, I find when I stop praying, coincidences stop happening. And uh, so, of course, Barbara had been covered in prayer before she left that day. So now we'll shift from back, that back to the hospital. They've taken her into OR, and um, the, uh, the doctor that uh, headed up most of the surgeries uh, in regards to the bones um, met with us after, um, 
after having gone in and, and, and fixed both of her legs. Now, um, her legs were uh, the uh, most serious insofar as having to get to those first because on her right leg, the femur had come out through the flesh and on the left lower leg, it had come out through the flesh. At the scene somewhere, uh, the first responder had put a tourniquet on her right leg, which most likely was part and parcel of God making provision to save her life, uh, because even with that, she had still bled out to the point she was unconscious when she got to the hospital. Well, um, after the first surgery, um, there's two doctors involved in that. They were four and a half hours working on the right upper portion of Barbara's leg and the left lower portion of her leg uh, broke in various places. And so they came in after four and a half hours. And so, uh, great words. He said, um, the things that we can't fix aren't broken. Her brain is showing no signs of damage whatsoever through the CAT scans, and her spinal cord is still intact. And so that was uh, great news. And um, he told me that there were upwards of 20 people around the OR table at that time, uh, working in various facets to stabilize her and to uh, make great attempts to save her life. Also told me that the timing could not have been more perfect insofar as the accident and her arriving at the hospital because at that time of the day, uh, everyone is in place. The staff is all in place. If it had happened in the middle of the night, that would have changed things considerably. Um, I'm moving as quickly as I can here and I want to save you all the time that I can, Barbara. Um, so. Then uh, there came a rundown of uh, what was broken. Now, some of this I didn't know till several days later. Now, it was 19 days before we knew of her left foot broken in four places and her uh, left lower arm, wrist, and hand broken as well. So that was day 19 before we found that out. But I'll give you uh, just a, a brief overview of of, of the amount of broken bones. Uh, we won't quite get to the, uh, to the x-rays yet, but we'll hear shortly. So uh, this impact, of course, as you can imagine, is it is unexplainable insofar as trying to logically put it together as to how anyone can survive that, but God. So the rundown of the, of the fractures, I'll, I'll, I'll start from the top, if you will. Um, Barbara had a broken neck, which was a very serious thing. Uh, the bone was actually split apart and, and um, had to be pulled back into place. I'll explain that a little more later, but so she had a broken neck. She had two breaks in her back. She had a broken right collarbone. She had a left upper arm break, a uh, couple of different breaks in that to the point where it looked like another elbow up there. Uh, the right lower arm was uh, broken in several places, uh, both of the main bones plus her wrist and her, uh, a bone in her hand as well. Um, so she had her left upper arm right lower arm, wrist, and hand, left upper arm, left lower arm, wrist, and hand. She had, well, at last count, it was six broken ribs, and the doctor said there's more up in here, but it's a little fuzzy, it's hard to see. So she had at least six broken ribs. Um, she had a injury on her chest, which I'll describe a little bit uh, more a little later. Um, she had... Um, broken right upper leg, the femur out through the side. She had, uh, the, the dash had come back and hit with so much impact that it had, it had pushed the knee into the femur and damaged the knee, the, the, the ball in the knee, and pushed the bone out through. 
She had a damaged left lower leg, uh, broke in several places, and uh, left uh, foot broken in four places. Um, that's approximately 30 breaks, uh, give or take. And so um, they called it a, a polytrauma. And so uh, in the process of time, they uh, begun to see Barbara as their Christmas miracle, one of two that year. Um, so the first day, as I mentioned, she had her operation on her two legs. And then that evening, she had to have emergency surgery on her chest. The uh, chief of surgery, Dr. Gooby, uh, came in and he said, uh, I've never done this operation before. He said, I've gone online and this will be only the fifth time in the world that this particular procedure has been done. He said, I've never done it before. I know how to do it. And so, well, we have to do it. Now is the time. It was, it was not going to wait. So uh, he goes in. He was really excited after the surgery uh, because he had got uh, multiple photos that he was going to be able to use in teaching. And so um, that was uh, quite an event that first evening. Now, let's see if we can just pop up the first x-ray. I'm just going to show you uh, some of these. I won't go over everything that we had talked about, but the first one was uh, Barbara's neck, and you'll see the screw. They had to go in through the front, out through the back to put a screw to pull it into place. That happened a little over two weeks after the initial accident. Uh, at first, he thought he might be able to uh, set it and keep it in place. That didn't take place. And so we're able to do it by surgery, so there's a screw in there. Um, let's go to the next surgery. Yeah, right there. You'll see, not very clearly, but you'll see two breaks in her uh, lower back. And the next, the next x-ray, yes, the next x-ray. This is, this is left arm. upper arm. I know it. It's my left arm. Yeah. I can tell. Left upper arm, yeah. I remember. This is her left upper arm. You'll see the plate in her left upper arm. Let's go to the next one. This would be her hand. left, My left, hand. left hand. She either can see better than I can or remember better, one or the other. <laughs> this is her left wrist and hand. Uh, the next one is... It's my right. Uh, this is the right. This is the right hand. Mm -hmm. um, you'll see the uh, rods going down the, 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 the right arm. And uh, you'll see uh, a plate in the you know, a plate in the wrist on the right arm as well. And this is the next surgery. Yeah, next, next, this, 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 this is the left lower leg, and you'll see this rod uh, running from her knee down to her ankle. And the next one, the next one is the right knee, as well as it shows part of the rod running up into the femur. They had to uh, build this knee up somewhat um, along with the screws and the plates and um, and so that's a, a brief rundown of the of the x-rays I'm almost finished Barbara I'll get as quickly as I can uh, I met Jack Allen at the elevator one time in the hospital and Jack said he had a big concern on his face of course as everybody was he said is she losing a lot of weight? <laughs> I said, Jack, by the time she gets out of here, she'll weigh 300 pounds with all that steel in her. <laughs> so uh, I'll talk quickly. I'm just almost to my last point here. Uh, Barbara had asked me to tell of the time in ICU. Um, and I will say right up front that uh, right from the get go, within a day or two, uh, Barbara arriving at the hospital, we put in place what they call the VIP, which uh, hinders people from being able to get in to see her. A couple of reasons for that, and I felt it was important to share that with you this morning because many of you wanted to visit, but uh, were curtailed by that. You couldn't even get a phone call through um, because of that decision. But number one, Barbara is a very private person and uh, really wanted to uh, respect her space. And number two, 
was she needed every bit of energy that she had for healing. Uh, we did have, uh, after about three weeks, a lady come in who was just cleaning, three or four minutes, no more. She was in the room cleaning. She talked to Barbara about books. Well, Barbara reads a lot, so she was quite willing to talk about books. But after she left, Barbara said, that woman tired me right out talking. And so that really confirmed that the decision was right uh, insofar as this VIP status. Uh, In ICU, um, Barbara was all kinds of tubes. Um, One tube uh, for breathing uh, because she was on the machine to keep her her, her breathing going. They had induced her into a coma, you know, the very first day. And so she had this uh, tube uh, for breathing. Another tube that would go into that, which would suction out the stuff that needed to come out in order for her to breathe. That was um, challenging to watch. Um, She also had a uh, feeding tube and uh, to keep some nutrition in the system, as well as uh, IVs for various... uh, medications and uh, blood work and and that kind of thing. Um, She had been put into a coma on the Thursday, was supposed to come out on the Saturday, but did not come out of the coma until the following Saturday. And uh, I really was not concerned about that uh, until late the next week, begun to uh, consider things. Doctors were very concerned because they felt that she should have been awake. Um, Rachel, uh, our daughter, had come up the day following. We'd gone out for a long walk. We had talked, felt that if the pain medication that she was getting was to be changed, that she would come out of the coma, which is exactly what took place. Um, I think I'm almost there. Um, One thing I will say There was not a mark on Barbara's face whatsoever. I think she'll discuss that a little bit further later. Not a mark on her face, not a mark on her head. Nurses were all uh, talking about, we've got to ask her what she does for her complexion. (laughs) And and so uh, that was a big uh, feather in her cap, if you will. And so uh, there were several other bones, of course, that didn't need operations. They just sat on their own. Uh, the, the ribs and the foot and, and, and what have you. Just a comment from the first responder. I, me- I got a chance to meet the first responder uh, that was on scene. Uh, he said two things that stuck out to me. He said, number one, he said, that woman ought not to be alive. He said, uh, and he was a senior first responder, been at it for many, many years. And he said, I've only, ever seen, I've only seen two miracles in my career, and she's one of them. And so um, I'm going to give it back to Barbara. Thank you, Hugh. I would describe my first sense of consciousness as a kind of veiled awareness, a kind of melting in and out sensation when I was able to discern voices and faces. And then I remember the painful coughing the constant suctioning of phlegm, the excruciating pain of people holding me tightly and turning me from time to time and wondering how long that was going to go on. I remember a male voice saying as he turned me how sorry he was. And I still had no idea about the full extent of my injuries at that time or that I had been in a coma. But I was aware that I was in an awfully miserable state. At one point during this difficult time, I dreamed that I saw Jesus standing beside me, and I was so impressed with his intellect, and also he was so calm about my situation, and I knew then everything was going to be okay. It was such a a stark contrast to what I was experiencing that I said right out loud, it's going to be okay now. And the nurse in ICU came over and said, are you okay, Barbara? And I said, yes, I'm okay. It's going to be okay now. And sometime later, I had another dream about bright, Jewish, capable physicians operating on me. 
and feeling such a profound sense of thankfulness. And I knew I was going to be okay. And I, sometime later, I asked Hugh if the doctors who oper operated on me were Jewish, and he said he didn't think so. And then, oh, you put the picture up already? Great. Now it's time to put the picture up. And then someone sent me a picture, a friend, who had no idea that I had that dream. But when I saw that picture, I cried because it brought the dream to reality. What it meant was it wasn't the doctors who were Jewish, but the one who was overseeing the doctors, the great physician, he was Jewish. As I became more lucid, I also became increasingly aware of my utterly helpless state. I was totally immobile because of all the casts and the aspen collar that I had to wear, and I felt like I was buried in a sea of blankets. It was a very frightening time because I would often cough up phlegm, and I was laying on my back, and I couldn't move my hands to ring the nurse for help, so I felt so very helpless. A bed sore developed on the back of my head at one point, which meant they had to shave an area of my head, put a dressing on, and I had to have that changed regularly. It took several months for that to heal. Then they started me sitting in what is called the McGill chair to get my back muscles used to sitting again. Five minutes seemed like an eternity, and I remember joking that it was a glorified high chair for adults. I hated being in that chair. I had a difficult time when I learned I was going to be moved to a shared room because I felt like I was losing the last little piece of control I had over my life at uh, some level of privacy. But anyway, I gradually adjusted to the other ladies in the room who were coming and going because of hip and knee surgeries, and I met some really lovely ladies. Well, for the most part, there were always a few. And, uh, I coined the term sleepovers with strangers to try to <laughs> create some levity in the situation. Eventually, I reached the point where they could start doing physiotherapy with me to develop range of motion in my fingers, hands, arms, and legs. And the physiotherapist taught Hugh how to do the exercises with me, so he worked with me faithfully every day. I went every time they came because I wanted to get well. I didn't want to remain in that state. And when the point came where they felt I could sit in a wheelchair, they used the lift to raise me from the bed and move me to the wheelchair. And I cried the first time they used that lift because it symbolized how totally helpless I was. The orthopedic surgeon told me that I couldn't put any weight on my feet until 12 weeks after the last surgery but I progressed so well that after seven weeks, he told me I could start doing some weight-bearing. His words were, your recovery is remarkable given the magnitude of your injuries. So I began the slow process of learning to stand, take steps, and eventually walking with a walker. For some time after the accident, every time I closed my eyes, it felt like I was looking in a kaleidoscope and I'd see these tiny pieces of things, but that gradually went away. And then I was able to remember phone numbers, PIN numbers, passwords, all those good things, as well as the scripture memory verses I had learned through the years. In late December, I developed a serious infection in that right knee and it went into the bone. So they had to do another surgery and take a plate out. And I remember being so discouraged because then I had to be, uh, have six more weeks of antibiotics by IV. And I was feeling so much despair that I had to stay in the hospital any longer. So I asked the doctor if I could go home. And so he arranged for intramural nurses and a physiotherapist to come into the home and uh, help me. So uh, January 10th, I was finally able to come home after 112 days in the hospital. Anyway, but I wasn't uh, prepared for how little I could do once I was back in my own house. 
I couldn't squeeze the water out of a face cloth because my hands were so weak. I couldn't dress myself. I couldn't turn over in bed without help. I couldn't make myself a coffee. I couldn't do laundry. And I cried out in pain when I tried to play the piano because my hands hurt so bad. And I ran into the walls and doors of the house trying to maneuver that wheelchair. I made a lot of scratches and a lot of marks, didn't I, Hugh? Yeah. I got Hugh to help me out of bed in the morning so I could have my alone time in the Word and have my coffee. But I became so impatient with myself when I couldn't do the things that I used to be able to do before the accident. And I was shocked at the level of anger and frustration I was feeling. So several days later, I finally cried out to the Lord and said, why am I feeling this way? I should be happy to be home. And he revealed to me that it's because you're afraid you're always going to be this way, and you need to learn to be patient with yourself. Take your time. So things have come a long way since January. I worked hard every day until I could eventually do the things I did before the accident. I now get out of bed before Hugh, make my own coffee, have my alone time, shower, get dressed, cook, clean, do laundry, go up and down stairs by myself if there's a railing there, and do all the things I did before the the accident. I'm not driving yet, but I plan to do so in the spring. The orthopedic surgeon told me the healing process will continue for some time to come, and my posture, which is so terrible now, will eventually get better as I continue with massage therapy. Having to wear that Aspen collar for three months pushed my neck forward, and I was bending over with a walker. That will come. When I was still in the hospital, one of the doctors told me I would be in pain for the rest of my life. And as soon as he left the room, I said to Hugh, I don't accept that. And Hugh said the same thing. I take one extra strength Tylenol in the mornings now before I get out of bed, and one Rebax is set before I go to bed. I don't know why I survived the accident while others in far less serious accidents have not. I know the scriptures do tell me that there is an appointed time for each one of us to die, but in the end I turn to Psalm 6820 that says, Our God is a God who saves. From the sovereign Lord comes escape from death. I just have a few more things to share with you, and it's relevant to the message that I had prepared for the ladies. And the message was about running your race. So if you could bring the scripture passage up. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us throw everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race that's marked out for us. Each one of us in this room has a particular race to run. I can't run your race, and you can't run mine. And I remember as a teenager, always wanting to know what the purpose of life was. I had to know the answers for things. And when I was 21, I made a decision to follow Christ, and it was the first time that I felt that life actually made sense. Runners in any serious race know why they're running, and where they're headed. Frederick Buckner, American theologian, Presbyterian minister, and writer said, the world is full of people who seem to have listened to the wrong voice and are now engaged in life work in which they find no pleasure or purpose and who run the risk of suddenly realizing someday that they've spent the only years that they're ever going to get in this world doing something which could not matter to them or to anyone else. So where are you headed, and what are you running for? You need to focus on today, and on days when you have no idea what lies ahead, focus on one step at a time. And don't assume that the race is always going to be smooth and straight. Sometimes there are unexpected detours. And clearly, I had an unexpected detour September 20th, not of God's making, of my own making. Someone asked me why God would, would allow me to have such a terrible accident. And I remember answering, it wasn't God who allowed this. I allowed it by making the wrong choice. 
I think a better question might have been, how did God allow me to survive such a terrible accident? And don't try to cheat in your race by trying to take shortcuts. I remember David O'Connor saying years ago, God will not do for you what you can do for yourself. I could pray all I wanted to to get better, but it wouldn't have meant anything if I wasn't willing to do the work. The doctors did their part, and now I needed to do mine. And in any serious race, there are people on the sidelines ready to help injured runners, either by carrying them off the field or helping them heal until they can get back in the race again. In my case, I had so many stretcher bearers, people who worked with me to help me get back in the race, some of whom are here today. If you helped at the accident scene, provided medical or nursing care, served as a porter, physiotherapist, massage therapist, prayed for me, sent cards, wrote letters, cooked meals, or in Gordy's case, ran the business for Hugh when he couldn't be there, please stand if you participated in any way in being a stretcher bearer in my situation. Folks, there are occasional victories in every race. Today is one of those days. So please give yourself a round of applause, and God used you, Hugh, as the main stretcher bearer. I thank you. Thank you. So I've been working hard at playing the piano again, and I can't quite play the same as I used to, but I can play better than I was when I got home. So I'll leave you with this verse before I play a song. And it's called, Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great God is your faithfulness. Thank you. I think Megan was going to come and lead this song, I think. She's coming. There she
Can we give God thanks this morning?